mindfulness means to keep something in mind. You develop it together with alertness, which is knowing what's happening while it's happening, and a quality called ardency. And ardency means that when unskillful thoughts come up in the mind, you try to get rid of them. When skillful thoughts are not yet there, you try to give rise to them, and once they're there, you try to maintain them. It's basically right effort. Ardency comes from a strong sense of the dangers that can arise if you just let the mind wander wherever it likes. Because your thoughts do have consequences. As the Buddha said, if your mind tends in a certain direction, if the thoughts tend to go in a certain direction, it, the mind will go there. Your actions will go there. Your speech will go there. So you have to keep in mind the fact that it's not just here watching things arise and pass away. When something good arises, you want to maintain it. But there's a place where the Buddha says when mindfulness starts taking control, this is what it does. It helps you recognize what's skillful and what's not, and whatever experience you've had in giving rise to skillful thoughts in the past, and whatever times you've gotten good results and whatever times you've gotten bad results from trying to maintain something skillful or trying to get rid of something unskillful. You want to be able to remember that. Because this is a skill. There's a lot of misunderstanding that comes from reading the Satipatthana Sutta and thinking that it tells you everything you need to know about mindfulness practice. And it sounds like you just watch things come and watch things go. But that's only it tells you only part of the picture. It sets out the whole description of right mindfulness. And then it focuses on simply one question. What are the different frameworks? What are the different frames of reference that you can use when you're practicing mindfulness? But it never asks any questions about what does it mean to be ardent as you're doing this? What does it mean to put aside greed and distress with reference to the world? Those parts of the mindfulness formula just don't get touched on. So for that, you have to look out elsewhere. And everywhere else in the canon, the Buddha says, if something unskillful comes to the mind, you want to put it out like a fire has suddenly appeared on your head. If your hair is on fire, if your turban's on fire, you would exert mindfulness to put it out. That doesn't mean you just simply watch the fire. You do what you can to put the fire out. The question is how to do this skillfully. A lot of times when something comes up that we don't like in the mind, we try to snuff it out, and we don't do it very skillfully. We just drive it underground, exert pressure on it, push it away. Of course, when you push it away, it's going to push back. This is one of the reasons why working with the breath is such a helpful way of dealing with issues in the mind. Because you'll notice that when any kind of thought appears in the mind, there's going to be a pattern of tension someplace in the body. Can you breathe through that pattern of tension? What happens when you do? It shows that you have an alternative. Because for most, most of us, there are just two alternatives. Either you bottle something up, when, which in which case it's like a one of those chemicals that when you bottle it up and put it, seal it off, it's going to explode in the bottle. You get nothing but glass shards everywhere. Or you don't wait for it to be bottled up and you just let it go out into your thoughts, words, and deeds. Neither alternative is good. That's why it's good to have other alternatives, like this ability to breathe through the tension that's holding the thought in place. And then when you can breathe through the physical side of the thought, then you can turn around and look at the mental side with a lot more equanimity. And ask yourself, well, where is this coming from? What are the assumptions here? To do this, you have to have developed really strong concentration. Otherwise, the analysis will destroy the concentration and you'll be just wandering around 
in a world of thoughts without really noticing, well, what brought this on? You want to see these things in action. So the first order of business is to get the mind to be as still as possible. Again, still without putting too much pressure on the body. And there will be a tendency when you get started out, when you're trying to keep the mind in one place, to put too much pressure on it, in which case the pressure will last for a while, make you feel uncomfortable, and then you get it released and then you wander away. Then you come back again and there's this long period of trying to find the right balance so that you're here and you're steady, but you're not putting too much pressure on any part of the body, any part of the breath. This takes time, takes practice. You do it again and again and again. And sometimes you lose your balance. It's like learning to ride a bicycle. You ride along, whoops, you lost your balance, you fell over. We get up again. Your knees are a little scraped, but that doesn't matter. You get up on the bike and you try again. And after all, you gain a sense of where your balance lies. And notice that when you're riding a bicycle, especially when you see little kids ride bicycles, they lean a little bit to the left, lean a bit to the right as they're putting pressure on the different pedals. And a lot of it is learning how far you can go as you lean one direction or the other and still maintain your balance and be able to recover your balance. And so it is with concentration. Sometimes you lean a little bit over to the stillness side. Sometimes you lead a little bit over to the observing side, and you can get knocked over either way. But when you learn how to do it right, you can lean one way, then the next, back and forth, back and forth like this, and not lose your balance. This is an important skill. So always keep in mind the fact that we're working on a skill here. The skill is trying to nurture skillful qualities and learn how to undercut unskillful qualities in a skillful way. So while you're focused on the breath, those are the thoughts you want to allow. You don't want to snuff out thought entirely. After all, there's directed thought and evaluation. Those are parts of the concentration practice. You think about the breath and you notice how the sensation of breath is moving through the body. Where does it feel good? Where does it not feel good? When it doesn't feel good, what can you do to change it? If you don't have any idea of how to change it, just watch things for a while and pose that question in the mind. If the breath were allowed to do its own healing work, where would it flow? Learn to get an instinctive sense of this. And as you watch it, then you get a sense of what you can do to nudge it in one direction or nudge it in another direction. This takes time. You're, again, you fall off the bicycle many times, but fortunately you don't have knees to scrape here. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and watch again. Experiment a little bit here, experiment there, then watch again. And your sense of how to maintain your balance will become more and more intuitive. <laughs>